Hey everybody. So today is like our four year anniversary of doing weekly uploads on YouTube. We haven't missed a week, I don't think. Um, and so we decided, I put up a Q&A on Instagram and you guys sent in a whole ton of questions. So I figured I'm making a sample of, so I made this big bag. This is called the Becky named after my friend from kindergarten who I made the first design for. And I'm scaling it down so we have a smaller version this is my first one, and it's it's okay, but I have to modify it. So, since I don't have a ton of time to do that with all of our regular work, I figured what I could do is I could work on this, and I could go through and answer your questions at the same time. Uh, you guys know I'm not really an ace with editing or anything, but we can definitely get through some questions while I cut this all out, get it lined, and that sort of thing. So let's get into it with our first question. Okay, first question. Can we see your face? Um, no. <laughs> but... I think it's probably important to talk about why I don't show my face. Um, mostly it's just, like, I value my privacy. Um, I've been doing the online stuff, you know, selling online for 14 years now. And I think people sort of, you know, we're by no means, we have a decent sized following, but we're by no means like a huge internet personality. But um, I think people don't really understand, like, just how far-reaching even a smaller following like ours is, you know? Um, like, I'll post, I've posted pictures of my cars that I drive, because I like old 4x4s, and even in our small town, um, you know, people will see, people that I've never met will see my car outside of a gas station and come in and ask everybody if they're Eric from Quarter. Um, and while I really, really, I understand and appreciate that we have such a privileged way to, you know, way to make a living um yeah just kind of i'm very shy and have social anxiety and kind of value my privacy so that's why you don't see my face um well didn't in boston you had your picture taken i did yeah when i was living in the city so i lived in boston until 2013 and um i had my picture taken and they put it on because we, we raised a bunch of money for um the japanese red cross when the tsunamis hit and they put my picture on the front page of the metro, I think it's called, the free tea thing. I love that. And <laughs> Living people, in the city. <laughs> yeah, people, like, people were stopping me all over the place, and I was like, I didn't, we didn't have YouTube, I think, you know, I, there was barely even, I mean, it was 2011, so, like, social media was just getting started. Um, but even then, like, people recognized me, and I was like, oh, I hate this. This is not what I'm in it for. So, you know, our intentions are really pure. We just want to share leather work. You know, it's not so much about who we are as much as it is just the projects, you know, keep it nice and benign. Plus, like, at this point, there is that big thing, too, because there are a lot of streamers now who use avatars, and the big thing is, like, in that respect, and I'm not saying that we really think about this because I genuinely don't care about this whole part of it, but, like, you guys already probably kind of have an idea of what I look like, and it's that whole never-meet-your-heroes thing where, like, if you have an idea of what I look like in your head... And then all of a sudden I'm showing my face all the time and it's not what you've ex come to expect over the last like five year, four years. Um, you know, it's just an unnecessary way to upset people in a weird, uncomfortable way. So yeah, so that's why I don't show my face. Um, short story long. Next question number two. Is Leathercraft your only work? Um, yes and no. This kid, kid, I have a lot of like little side hustles. I have a hard time making hobbies and then just keeping them as hobbies. So like, I bought my first house and my hobby was renovating it, but that turned into like, I've owned a few houses, a couple of houses that I've lived in and flipped because I'm single, so why not like make a little bit of money? Um, I have was super into buy, sell, trade, rare bourbon and whiskey for a long time. Kind of cut back on that because I don't really, I didn't stop drinking. I just kind of got too old and two or three drinks left me with a headache in the morning, so. I don't drink that much, so I don't do that much anymore. But for the most part, leather work has been my full-time job since I was 19. Um, I started quarter when I was 19. Very quickly, it became more profitable than I was working at Eddie Bauer in Downtown Crossing, for those of you who know Boston. Um, by the time I was 20, it was full-time, and I've never had another job. You guys have just kept ordering wallets and later on watching our videos and ordering patterns, and we're very lucky that this is what we get to do all the time. Um, what distance do you set your wing dividers 
um, for stitching. Good question. Um, these are the ones that I, these never change. And they are, I believe they're three and a half millimeter. Yep, three and a half, maybe a uh, four, four millimeter, something like that. But then I also have these, um, and I'll vary the stitch line depending on what piece, like, like this, if you're doing a rolled edge, sorry, this one's not good. If you're doing a rolled edge, this stitch line's gonna be like five millimeters. This one I do five because it's got like a, the binding, so there's a lot of like material, so I want it to be inset a little bit. Um, but generally, I guess, I've just had this set for literally probably 10 years. Um, four millimeters is the, what I go with. So check this out. These are called tuck locks. Well, this is half of a tuck lock. This is a full tuck lock, and it's basically, you install that part there, and then this is the springy part, and it goes right in like that. It's super, super easy to install. So I'm gonna, I guess I'll just give you a little tutorial. Um, but next question. Um, do you get a lot of foot traffic at your shop or more online business? Um, our shop is not open to the public. We're not a store. So we're 100% online. Um, let's see, so what I'm gonna do is, I bought these like straight cut things. So what you do is, it has these four tabs and your goal is to cut slits to slide the four tabs in, and then on the back you fold these over with some blocking plates, and then you line it and you're good to go. Cutting little straight cuts has always been like my least favorite thing in the world to do. So I got, it came in like a big set from uh, Crimson. They have all these just like little straight cut pieces, these little straight cut punches that are honestly super awesome. They're, I use them way more than I thought I would. So all I did is in my top, in my pattern, I just put a, I, I marked out like the top corners, not the bottom, the top right here of each side and made a square. And then I use my awl to just make a mark. So then I know the top, basically I punch everything in. So from the top down, from the bottom up, and this gets me like a perfect, um, perfectly square install every time. And like cutting the slots like this is so much easier than using an exacto, wondering if you're gonna, you know, cut too much or cut past where you need to. Super easy. All right, um, what have you made that you are most proud of from leather or anything else? <clears throat> I'm gonna say here, and Kaylina can feel free to disagree with me if she wants, but I think that I'm most proud of just our work environment. Um, you know, we, we work hard and we, we, we work a lot, but at the same time, like, if we need to do something with family or if something comes up, um, we're able to remain fairly flexible. Um, and that comes from, I was a big like Tim Ferriss fan growing up and he like, I, I guess it's kind of old news at this point, but he's like the four hour work week guy. And his big thing was design a life that you want and then design your business to fit in that life, not the opposite way around. And I really tried to do that. Personally, I work like a ton, but I enjoy doing it. So I'd say that's the thing I'm most proud of creating. Um, I don't think it's like a physical thing that I've designed or anything like that. To install these, there's little backing plates and they slide on and then you see they have like the little groove here. That's for these like uh, legs to fold over, but they fold over way too far. So what I do is first, I just come on with a set of clippers. You kind of have to like pop them down and I clip them pretty short, not super short, but just so that once they're installed, they're not hanging out past that little, this little metal guy here. Um, so the next question is, how did you get to the skill level that you're at now and who are your leather heroes? Um, I mean, I've been doing it for 14 years, so like, I don't know, 14 years? That's how it took, how long it took. Um, I learned from like Angel Fire websites and leatherworker.net because there wasn't like YouTube. I don't, I don't know when YouTube launched, but it wasn't a prevalent way to watch videos when I started in 2007. Um, there certainly wasn't a lot of leather content on there. I've literally learned just from taping, from videoing. Yeah, Kaylina. <laughs> behind the camera. Uh, yeah, Kaylina will like, um, I'll come over like after lunch or whatever and Kaylina will be making something that I never taught her how to make because so for those of you who don't know, Kaylina came on with me about seven years ago and had never done any leather work. So um, I kind of trained her from the ground up. But 
Okay, so see now we're folding these tabs over into these little slots here. Um, but she picks up a ton of stuff just from her videos, I guess, which, you know, I've learned a lot pushing myself to be able to make these videos for you guys as well. I've kind of gained a lot of confidence in not just making little wallets and stuff. I've gotten way more into bags and just generally like out of the day-to-day -day mundane stuff and more into the fun creative stuff that I was kind of uh, not doing as much as I should have before we started making videos. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of 14 years of doing it professionally. You get really good at stuff and you learn how to optimize and streamline because we've at most been a three-person business. We're only a two-person business now. Um, and so there's our installed piece. You can see there we have to do the other one. The other thing is like you kind of got to like whack one side or another and then when you whack one side the other side comes up but eventually they both sit flat. Um, and of course if there are better ways to do this I don't install a whole lot of these so feel free to leave it in the comments if you have a better way to do it. Um, so we have to get the other one installed. Second part of that question, Leather Heroes. I don't know that I have Leather Heroes, but I can tell you what got me started. Um, all the Japanese brands, Red Moon, Wild Swans, KC's, I wanted one of their wallets. In 2007, they didn't even, there were no real websites that you could buy things from in Japan to have them just shipped directly here, so you had to use what was called a proxy. And a proxy was some person living in the country and you would basically send them money plus like 10% for their service fee. And they would like physically walk to a store, buy what you wanted and ship it to you. Um, I think the yen was kind of high at the time. And I was also 19, so I didn't have $400 for a wallet. And uh, so that's how I started Leatherwork was I wanted to make myself a wallet, which I think is a very, you know, popular way to get started. Um, however the people that I sort of reverse engineered my first wallets from were those brands. Um, I love, love, love Red Moon. I love uh, Wild Swans, even though I know they're mostly machine sewn. They're just, I mean, their work is just impeccable and beautiful. And um, Casey's was, I remember I really liked Casey's because they did like a vertical card slot, like the, or like the, their bifold cards slots were, they weren't horizontal, they were vertical. And I really like that more. So I basically took like a Red Moon design, but then added that pocket design to it when I made my first wallet. Actually, I can get my first wallet. Okay. No, it's not in here. <laughs> so these are some of my first wallets. Um, you can see like, this was what I was really inspired by, right? All the Japanese stuff. That's actually before I had any brand, I just got like a little stamp set. And I was like, huh, how can I make it into a brand? So I just stamped the R's upside down. But this is like one of the, this is 2008 maybe. Um, and then I moved on to like bigger stuff like this and I got a little more minimal, didn't do as much Western detailing. But it was all inspired originally by those big Japanese brands. Flathead a little bit too, Flathead did those really nice mid-length wallets. So do you ever design an illustrator? Um, yes, that's, I draw first, but all my patterns, this is all illustrator. Um, I went to, I have a graphic design degree, so we spent a lot of time in illustrator. It's what I'm most comfortable in. And yeah, I just do simple designs like this. I don't put any real, I'll do center line marks and stuff, but I don't put stitch lines in because I just never have. Um, so the next step here, this is our nylon backing. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna peel this off and then stick both of these to it. It'll kind of hide our bumps here uh, now that we've got them nice and hammered out. Invest in good leather or invest in good tools? Um, <laughs> Um, so I feel like this is situational, right? So if you have like one job that you need a tool for, um, let's take stamps for example. You get a custom order and someone wants their logo stamped in it. So of course a brass stamp is going to be like 100 or 200 or $300. A magnesium stamp is going to be 30 or $40. Now you know that a magnesium stamp is only going to get you 10,000 impressions when a brass stamp will get you 100000 so the price long term is worth it, but if you're only going to use the tool for one job, you might as well just go the cheaper. However, um, say you're just getting started, I would urge you to not get expensive anything to start, because then you have a lot of pressure, oh my god, I'm stuck, um, <laughs> you have a lot of pressure to enjoy the craft because you just spent all this money on it. I started out with, I got $8 stitching chisel from Tandy, 
and I used it for three years, and then I upgraded, and then I upgraded again. Uh, I'm not like a huge, the reason I love Leathercraft is I had a bunch of little businesses before this, and I was obsessed with being a business owner, not like whatever the business was. With Leathercraft, like I'm a, really not a great business person, I just want to be making leatherwork, and that's how I knew that leatherwork was something that I wanted to stick with. Um, so that's like a non-answer answer. answer. Um, I would say if you have the choice, if you're just getting started, I would get better tools and cheaper leather because I'm a big proponent of practice, practice, practice with leather. Get a bunch of cheap leather, literally just cut it to shreds learning how to st cut straight lines, cut it to shreds again learning how to cut curves, then sew it up and make just strips of leather that you can't make anything out of just to practice your stitching. So I would get cheap leather, better tools, do that first. Once you've started like making wallets and stuff, um, I think probably, you know, then your end product is your goal. Learning isn't your goal. So I would go with good quality materials and hopefully by then you amassed a decent um, collection. I mean, even just like, you know, just the Weaver stitches and chisels. I mean, we use these every day and have for a year. They're, they're fine. They're not, you know, are they, do they give the tooth profile of a crimson? No, but this is $25 and this is $200. You know what I mean? So it's, I always say it's kind of like um, road bikes, right? The upper, upper echelon carbon fiber stuff is very nice, but it's not as utilitarian. Whereas this stuff is nice and strong. Those other chisels are perfectly strong too, but like this will get you going. And the most important thing is to be a leather crafter. Um, I think, who was it? John Mayer had a quote about um, people come up to him and say, I'm so frustrated to write songs that I don't write any because I'm afraid they'd be bad. And his response was, well, if you don't write any songs, you're not a songwriter. But even if you write bad songs, you're still a songwriter. And it's the same with other work. If you're too afraid to like get leather and cut into it because it was expensive, then you're not working with leather at all. So I would say get the tools and um, and materials that you financially feel comfortable with kind of screwing up because you're, if you're just learning. But as you get advanced, you kind of get a feel for like what, you know, I like to have a really nice cutting knife. I like to have really nice dividers, but I'm fine with the $35 edge bevelers and I'm fine with you know, the cheaper strap and punches and that kind of thing. It's all personal preference. So here's a big one we got like a bunch of different versions of. How do you find a niche market in the leather, in Leathercraft? Um, been searching for months and can't find any. So Leathercraft is very crowded right now. Um, I can only speak from personal experience. I benefited from being the first to market basically. And I initially, um, you know, I made my first, it was like a snap wallet posted a picture of it on a fashion forum I was on. A bunch of people wanted them because there was no one in America making them. You had to order one from Japan for three or 400 bucks. So I kind of was like an accidental business owner at that point. I had to like be like, hey, I'll take a list of people that want them, but I actually have to learn how to make them before I'm willing to like sell them to anyone. And I was like, they took me eight hours. I sold them for a hundred bucks. Like, you know, I knew I was getting paid to learn and I was very lucky. These days it's a little different, right? Um, you can literally find a niche, meaning you find like some random hobby, let's say archery, and you start making arm guards and all the accessories that archery people need. You know, that's a, a niche in, in that sense. The other way you can look at it is that you make a very, uh, you make a pro you're making products with broad appeal, right? Satchels, accessories, wallets, belts, everybody uses some sort of those things. So the niche then can be more of a lifestyle niche, right? You can make wallets for unicycle riders and you can make beautiful leather wallets and stamp unicycles in them. And maybe, you know, you get on board in the unicycle world and you get a big, a big old following making unicycle wallets or surfing wallets or, you know, whatever. The other thing is you can do is you can go just full on lifestyle design. So, you know, you have brands like We've talked about this before, but you have brands like, uh, I'm going to date myself here, Hurley and Quicksilver and that <laughs> kind of thing, right? And they all had, and Billabong, they all were sold in rural stores in the middle of America, but because they aligned themselves with like surfing and, you know, mellow vibes and that kind of thing, everyone wanted to align their own personality with it. So they bought them. It wasn't just surfers buying the stuff. So you can do that as well. You can make a plain basic wallet. But if all of your branding and your media, social media content, and if you're running ads, if that's all portraying a specific lifestyle, 
you're not so much selling the product as you are the lifestyle. So you can do it that way. A piece of advice I heard recently was follow your jealousy. Follow your jealousy? Yeah. So you see what you're, see what you're jealous of in other products or lifestyles or whatever, and try to align yourself with, with that instead of just following your passion. That's interesting. Right? I don't know how I feel about that. I'd have to think on it. <laughs> I know a lot of like, uh, basically every, every one of our core products was just, I'm a big subscriber and like, I make, you know, I make things I need and assume people, other people will need them as well. And that's worked out well, but that is very much a lot of luck because a lot of our product line was designed when I was like 24 and had no idea what I was doing. But we sell most of the same stuff that we did 10 years ago because that's the good thing about accessories and male leaning accessories is that there really aren't a ton of fashion cycles. You can kind of make one thing. I mean, look at Louis Vuitton. They've been making a lot of the same bags for a hundred years and you can make them in a classic way that they just never go out of style, which makes your designing a lot easier. Um, the jealousy thing I'd have to think on. It's, it's interesting. I definitely think like, you know, the old school classic answer is find a hole in the market and fill it. Um, but if you just want to make bifolds, you're going to basically, your job is going to be marketing yourself in a way that you're looking for people to align their personal beliefs with what you're giving off. You're not just trying to sell them a wallet that has some sort of gimmick. But at the same time, you can also, you know, you can, um, you can design something new out of leather and like our bottle hook, you know, you can do that with leather as well if you want. Um, there are multiple ways to go about it. Um, okay, what did the transition look like from hobbyist to professional? So this question I get a lot, when do I quit my job? When do I know it's time to go full time? Um, my story is a bit unique because I was either, I think I was 20, I was working retail and it was just, I was losing money going to work. Like I had a lot of wallet orders um, and so I just kind of stopped going to work. But you have to remember with all of this, like even now, I'm a single dude, I have no family, like I have the freedom to kind of do whatever. If you have a family, if you're older, um, you know, you might not have the that ability and it's a much scarier thing to lose financial, um, what's the word, stability, uh, to go out on your own and make wallets. So my, I, my usual advice is keep a full-time job until you're losing money going to work, right? So if you wake up one day and you say, I could make $700 in orders right now, or I could make $150 going to work and I have to go to work, that might be the time where you think, okay, it might be worth it to go full time. Until then though, I always, always say keep a job because this is the most important thing. You have to be creative in this field. And if you quit your job and you say, okay, I have to, I have to make money now via my leather work to pay my rent, that kind of kills your creativity because you're kind of forcing yourself to make the things that the market is supporting. Um, so you want to keep as much creative freedom as you can in the beginning because that's really the way that you come up with those unique ideas that get you noticed and that makes your brand unique. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of leather workers out there now. When I started, I was the only one online, you know, on the inter in the United States. You know, I wasn't the only leather worker ever. It had just kind of died off a bit. Um, now there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people that do this. And so you do have to be, you know, you do have to have that competition mindset in a way where you have to make something that's better, stronger, cheaper, or faster um, in order to capture people's attention or unique, you know? And don't get me wrong, I'm all about community and stuff, but at the end of the day, business is business. So I would say um, until you're losing money going to your job that's not leather work, I would not quit that job to pursue leather work full time. But you'll generally know, you know, when you, when you get into it and if you're lucky, things start going well for you. You generally get the feeling and you're like, oh, this is a, you know, this is a thing. But you have to keep in mind too, what comes with that is you just, you don't have, I've never had a guaranteed paycheck in my life ever. Um, you know, every day you wake up with some semblance of either this could all go away tomorrow or am I prepared? Should I get hurt and can't make stuff? Um, I have Kalina for that now and have for a long time. Um, you know, I could get, you could get sick and that could put you behind. There's a lot to think about when you own any small business, but leather specifically, you know, where there's a lot of manual labor involved, 
you do have to think about more than just, okay, are we making enough money through this now that I can quit my other job and still pay my mortgage? Um, so it's not a decision to be taken lightly, but at the same time, depending on your field, if you can sort of hop back into a job, if things don't work out, go for it. You know, it is, it is a really, I can't imagine a better life that we could have fallen into. Um, but yeah, it is, there's a lot of stresses that go behind running a business. Um, that if you've never done it before can be a bit surprising to learn all the ropes. Or you could be like me and fall into the job. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But you're more of an employee. As much as you are half of this business, like, I handle the day-to-day -day of, like, the how are we keeping the lights on stuff. You just design cool bags and make amazing wallets. Right. You know? But, they could, you know, you could also find an apprenticeship if you're not... If you're not ready to have the business end maybe just learning even just like having a creative space to be in yeah that's true maybe Surround even if it doesn't people making it stuff. doesn't even never necessarily have to be leather it could be yeah. anything creative because once you get your creative juices going then it gets puts you in that that position where you're you get on a roll and you get it yeah. You can you don't stop. The creative mindset. Yeah. I think that's what happened with me. I was, you know, doing yeah, photo I was doing photography for a while and you know, it wasn't really the right fit. But then just like being able to be here and have like a creative space it like it really can set you off. Yeah. And it was almost you like a, it was like a ticking it was like a there was like a timer for you. Like you just like a couple of years ago, all of a sudden, you just, like, fell into it and started designing. Like, everything clicked. Well, because... It was of, really interesting. And it's because I was, like, holding a camera, watching you be creative, and then given, given the space of, to be creative. It's just, yeah. like... it's just, I think a lot of it is just space, right? Like, yeah. mind space and... And that falls back to not quitting your job because right. then you give yourself the, the, the space to think about, instead of thinking about how am I paying my bills, you can think about how am I going to design this wallet right. because you know you have a paycheck coming in. Right, absolutely. Yeah. The stress of... Of bringing home money and being an adult, <laughs> being an adult, especially if you have a family, is yeah. you know that's that's a whole. Other that is the one thing that I can't speak thing. to as much because I don't have a family of my own yet. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I am still bachelor living, but I try yeah. to focus. But I didn't my have. Around everybody. I didn't have children until after, so that's, true. that's a whole. That's you know. true. They did know both of our names at the package store back then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Um, we're going to move on, but quick one. What is a tool you thought you'd never need, but use it all the time? Um, I, this freaking roller. <laughs> I just got it. It's so useful for everything. Because, like, when I was flattening stuff like this before, I'd just take, like, a bone folder and be like, oh, yeah, no, I'm flattening it. That works. This is so much better. It doesn't make any scuffs. It rolls nicely. I'm freaking obsessed with it for no reason at all. Um, vice versa. What tool you thought I miss okay so what tool did I think I needed but I never use I don't know we keep a very small workshop like I don't have a lot of we don't have any really superfluous stuff I don't think mm -hmm. like we use pretty much everything I think we have doubles and triples of things because we have so the workbench you see is not the workbench we work at all the time we work at this workbench because it's in front of a window and that's that's all of our lighting like we don't use fancy lighting or anything but our other workbench in the back We've ended up like kind of building two sets of tools so that we don't have to constantly move everything, but we still have stuff that we move all the time. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think that we have any tools that we've really just never used. No. Um, it's, with leather work, it's just kind of the nature of the beast that you're going to have tools that you don't use as much. Like, for example, I punch a lot more like stitching holes with stitching chisels than I do with this straight punch, right? I might use this four punches in an entire project, but this is worth its weight in gold for me because it makes those punches perfect, you know? What inspires slash motivates your design process? I think that that answer to that question has evolved over time. Um, when I initially started, pure utility motivated my design process because this stuff, you couldn't just go on Etsy and buy a natural veg tan wallet, right? And so I knew I wanted one, but then more people wanted them. So I was like, okay, my design process is going to be, because I'm one person, how do I make a just universal utilitarian piece that's going to last a long time and isn't going to be like offensive to look at? I took a very 
because I have a formal fine art training in graphic design, I took a very sort of graphic design approach where like perfect design blends in and you don't notice it, right? So a lot of our production pieces are just meant to be very inoffensive, utilitarian, sort of generic, good looking, you know, they look okay when you first get them, but they look really beautiful once you've used them and it's the patina that gives them their character, which is what I've always wanted. I mean, I don't have, I guess I don't, I've, I love making stuff, but I, I wouldn't call what I do art because it's not, I'm not trying to express an emotion or a feeling, you know, I'm just trying to, I, you know, I get off on make, on finding solutions to problems that are elegant and functional. Um, and I suppose, you know, you can talk about what is and isn't an art all day, but in my mind, um, concept is a big part of art. And the only concept here is utility. Um, once I get into stuff like this now that I'm making more bags and stuff like that, you know, I um, my inspiration comes from a lot of different things. Um, mostly vintage pieces, not necessarily leather work. Um, you know, I have plenty of Pinterest mood boards and that kind of thing. I used to go to Brimfield all the time, which is this huge antique uh, fair in Brimfield, Massachusetts. And it's, I think it's one of the biggest in the country, but it's so close to New York that I got to witness firsthand um, a lot of brands, Double RL, Ralph Lauren, J. Crew. they would send dozens of box trucks there. And it would just be a bunch of like younger dudes and women um, just like getting, just filling box trucks with inspiration. And what they would do is then they would go back and they would put all this inspiration in a room and they would sit in that room and design the new collections. I'm, I'm probably paraphrasing, I've never been part of the process, but that's what I gather they would do. And I, I don't do that, I don't, we're not filling box trucks over here. But you know, we, we have a, a small vintage collection. Um, I do browse, um, it's mostly online because it's really difficult, like it's such a niche product, like you can't just go to a flea market and have your select, you know, your choice of old leather bags. So it is a lot of like eBay and that kind of thing to sort of find pieces. But the most important thing for me is getting them in my hands and like seeing how they're constructed, seeing how they feel, because that's a big thing. You know, you can feel something worn in and you can go, oh, wow, it might be a little stiff. It might be a little unrelatable the minute you get it. But once it's worn in, it works perfectly. Um, and not copying those things, but sort of just finding inspiration in those things to sort of advance the current design or apply those design elements to different things. So I'd say that's probably where I get the inspiration from. Um, I also have, Kaylina's kind of like this now too, that she started designing. You get, we call it like creatively constipated. So you'll wake up one day and you feel like this weird anxiety and you know that like you have, there's something in you that needs to come out design wise. And like, you feel kind of bad until you can get it out on paper, or you can make a physical product. And then once, once you get the design out, it doesn't have to be perfect, but once you get the concept out, you're like, okay, I can breathe, let's eat lunch, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that there's, I think anyone can learn how to design, but I don't, I, I don't know. I, I think, feel like we're probably getting a little too deep into this, but I think that that draw is something that not everyone might necessarily have. I think you kind of either evolve into it, you're born with it, or your design process is just different. That's just how it works for me. To do it. I got it. <laughs> nice. okay. um, we had a question, what kind of glue do you use? barge cement. Um, we used to use Weldwood a lot because we were lazy and they sold it at the hardware store, but it's like less sticky. They changed the formula, I think. And so we use barge cement now, which we did use before when I remembered to order it, to be fair. Now I just have to make sure I keep it in stock. Because um, when you're our size, it's a little weird with the reordering, right? Because we do volume, but we don't do enough volume where we're just like every month we have to order a gallon of glue. So anywho, um, so now we're going to, I have to make the piping that goes around the front of this bag. And we actually got a question that says, for the piping core material, what do you recommend and where do you buy from? There are a lot of different things you can use for piping material. Um, I use stuff that some people think is comically large. I do that on purpose. I like the bigger piping look. I think it adds a, an interesting dynamic that you don't necessarily point out, but you definitely notice when you look at the bag. So this is three millimeter leather cording from Leather Cord USA. They sell from one millimeter up to like seven or eight, maybe nine millimeter. It's just leather cord. Um, 
You can also use one or two. You can also use um, fishing line. That's a Beto trick if you watch Beto's other works here on YouTube as well. He uses, uh, not fishing line, um, weed whacker core. You can use that if you want a smaller, like more designery style piping. Um, and so what I do is I cut this down to size basically. Once These are samples, so I don't have a measurement, but eventually I'll have a measurement involved. I cut it down to size. I skive it so it sort of fades down. And then the goal is, you can see this one's kind of half done, but the goal is on this bag, that fade will fade right under this um, binding, right? And this is, you can see how it's a little bit big. It's not overpowering because you have a lot of big features in the bag. I don't know, I just really like the bigger, the bigger style piping. It's just always been something I really like, and so I do it. Uh, and that is three millimeter leather cording. I like also using leather cording because it breaks in a lot more similar to the rest of the bag than plastic. Um, I've never had it happen, and I have used plastic cores a whole bunch, but um, the one issue that you kind of you can run into if you're using very thin leather to to wrap your piping in is if you use a non-leather core um, like a plastic, it can actually if it's on a corner over time, the plastic can kind of like wear through the leather, whereas with leather. And granted, I haven't been making bags for 30 years, so I don't have a, you know, enough case studies to totally prove this. But the bags I have made, um, you're never really going to see that happen because the leather uh, core is also sort of wearing in with the leather that it's wrapped in. So if you dent, say you drop your bag and you dent the, the piping, um, you're not going to dent just the leather and the plastic is going to be like hard on the back and rip the leather, it's going to dent the cord as well. Um, so yeah. Okay, so uh, tell us some of your hobbies. Honestly, leather work is the biggest one. People don't really believe me when I say this, but Kaylina can attest to this. Uh, I'm obsessed and even on the weekends, like I'm just in the shop, if I don't have anything going on with friends and stuff, because you do have to make time for friends and you do have to get out of the shop. It's not healthy to be there 24 hours a day, but um, I don't know. You come in and see whole bags that I've made over the weekend sometimes. Mm -hmm. I just love leather work, and that's, and that's how I knew. Like, uh, when I was 16, I painted guitars and sold them on eBay. I installed stereos. In college, I had a little t-shirt brand, and it was always, um, I wanted to be a business owner first, and whatever the business was was secondary. When I started leather work, I, like, didn't even have a website for the first year just because I, I was obsessed with making things out of leather, and I think that's how, I think that's probably, like, one of the more accurate definitions of passion. I try not to be one of those like people who says they're out to inspire people because I, I don't know, I think that's kind of like, I'm just here to show you how to do stuff. If you want to do it, that's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, leather work, but then I do uh, I do some pottery. I do, I like to, I work with my hands. So I built a kitchen from scratch in my last renovation, all the cabinet boxes, built everything out of plywood. Um, I do pottery, I do some automotive stuff. I have a bunch of like, old 90s cars that I work on and fix them up. Um, I like doing the home renovations. I'm actually starting to build a house that I, I basically flipped a bunch of houses to make enough money to like build a house that I can live in because I was 26 and had no money and bought my first house on a 0% government loan. Um, so I've worked my way up now to where I've earned enough, no quarter involvement at all. I've just learned enough flipping houses to put a down payment on uh, building a small house of my own. So that'll be a big project in the next two years is, you know, I want to hand make all the cabinets and do the bathroom and um, Kayleen's partner is going to help me. He's going to do all the tiling, which is going to be really special. Um, so yeah, those are my hobbies. And, You're into wine. Oh, I like wine. Yeah, I do. I do um, follow a few vineyards and, um, and winemakers in California and some on Long Island. And but that's one of my, I have, I don't spend a ton of money on superfluous stuff, but I will you know, I do have a few mail subscription or mail clubs that I'll, or wine clubs that I'll get like a case every six months or whatever and treat myself that way. Plants? Um, plants, yeah. We breed plants here. Um, these, but then if you spin around, we have like our whole breeding station where we've got pink princesses going. We have about 30 of those now. What else do we do? Solar stuff. Solar stuff. We build, I build, I like uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries and solar panels and um, actually, if you pan that way, those are all 20 amp hour batteries and um, some ammo boxes. And you, I put the batteries in the boxes with charge controller and make my whole family. I've been making them 
little solar boxes so when the power goes out they can put a little 50 watt solar panel out and have some power to charge their phones and stuff so you know i'm crafty i like to i like to keep busy so we'll let this dry we'll roll it up and while we're rolling it up i'm going to pick one final question and then this will be the end of me just talking at you for however long this video is so second to last question while this glue's drying any news on the pounder release so the pounder is in reference to the quarter pounder which is a hammer that we designed um, you guys know I've always used this as a crate hammer and like the second video we ever made someone said we should make our own hander and call it the quarter the, make our own hammer and call it the quarter pounder that was four years ago and I said I responded to it I said we absolutely will this is the CNC version we do have actually there might be one under here so we do have we've been going through you might have got my face there <laughs> did I <laughs> um, we've been going through the process of having them these are sand cast iron We've been going through the process of ha having everything done. It's just a really slow process, guys. It's That's basically it. We're trying to have them made in the USA. We're trying to do it small batch. Uh, we pretty much have everything done now. These are the first samples where things weren't aligned and they weren't tumbled. Um, but we're just trying to figure out a good coating so they don't rust. We want them to last, obviously, forever. Um, and you can see, like, the process. So this, see all this pitting? That was the first cast. So we had to figure out, like, which sand to use and all that kind of casting stuff I don't know much about. Um, we also have, we're not doing a full line of tools, I'm just doing a couple things, but you guys have asked a lot about my brass handle. That is also something we designed. Ugh. And we have those. We have a few hundred of them. And they're beautiful. They're all solid brass. Um, we designed this from the ground up. This isn't just a stock thing. We, all the measurements are ours. Um, it fits any X-Acto style blade. It also is hollow on the inside, so it's heavier than a regular aluminum blade but you can put brass rod or different types of metal in there all the way down to make it heavier depending on your preference. Um, and very minimal branding, anything like that, you know. We have some awls that we're developing. This is a bone handle with a Damascus blade with our logo in it. Um, but it all just takes time, you know. I mean, you can, the way that tools work in the leather world is there are like three to five big players um, in Asia making these tools. And you can either pick out of their catalog or you can go to someone totally random and say, listen, I want to make this. Let's develop the whole process. Um, in, the, in the case of the quarter pounder, that's basically what we're doing. And it just takes a lot longer. You're kind of seeing in real time. I've been using this thing for like a year, but they're still not ready to release yet. And I have enough, we have enough experience with product releases through the bottle hooks and that sort of thing that I don't want to take any chances. And I don't want to release one thing at a time. I just want to release, we're going to release the quarter pounder, the hand, the blade handles, and the awls all at the same time. Um, are we getting into other tools? Not necessarily. I just, these were three pieces that our sponsor Weaver doesn't sell. They were three pieces that I just wanted to own myself. Like I said, necessity being the mother of invention for us most of the time. I've always wanted, you could see um, how shiny this one is and how patinaed mine is from being used for like seven months. These things I think are going to be amazing. The, the weight on them, Kaylina can weigh in oh, on this. Oh, I love it. I love mine so much. They're really heavy when you get them in, and then once you start using it, you're like, how do I, how did I even use an aluminum light handled one? There's so much more control. Yeah. So I'm very excited, but at the same time, I want to do it right. Um, we're not coming out with like edge battlers or anything. I don't want to be a leather supply company. Um, I just want to make a few, we call it bench candy, like pretty well-made stuff that you can look at it and really enjoy when you're not using it. It can like be out on your desk and look nice. So that's the quarter pounder story. We're, we're trying as hard as we can um, for a small two person company. We can only have so many baskets to put our eggs in and that basket, you know, we have to take those eggs out and put them somewhere else sometimes, but it is always in the background running. We are always working on it and hopefully sometime early next year, we'll be able to release these things. Now that our glue's dry, we can just kind of roll this up. I like to pinch it from the middle and kind of work my way out. Oh, we have our last question. Let's pick a real good one, hold on. Um, that's a good one. Oh, a nice light one to end it. What's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? Kayleen is going to take this one while I, uh... Oh, no. <laughs> probably, I, I'd probably say memes. Memes. Okay. All right, I'm going to expand on that and say happiness. I think uh, being happy is a good one to aim for. I don't know. That's a little heavy for us. We just make wallets. <laughs> I would say in a little bit more of a serious answer, because I know a lot of you guys want to be like professional other workers and stuff. I've had a very privileged career and I've made it to the top 
of places I didn't think I could make it to. I've worked with big companies when I was younger. I don't do it anymore. I pulled back. Um, and I worked so hard thinking I wanted that sort of white picket fence, couple of cars, like, you know, that life. And back when I was in my early 20s, um, I had that. I had enough money to get basically anything I wanted. And it was the least happy I've ever been in my life. And so, you know, I don't mean to get super serious about any of this stuff, but it is a very privileged position to have that experience when you're 26. Because then you can go about living your life searching for, you know, more importance than just the monetary success. Um, we pulled all of our wholesale accounts. We sell direct to customer. We started making videos instead and focusing on having real personal relationships with people. Um, because I also worked alone for seven years before I hired Kalina, which was seven years ago. Um, and I had like a mental breakdown. It wasn't good. Um, so I would say, you know, there's a lot of hustle, hustle culture. There's a lot of like work and work and work and work until you, um, until you make it and then work some more. Um, I would say to kind of just like not listen to that stuff. Um, like we talked about in the four hour work week book, um, design your life, design the life that you want. So literally write down like, I want to live in an apartment. I want to have a, this kind of car. I want to have time to go hiking or ride my bike or do pottery or whatever. And then figure out how you can make your business fit into that life. Don't do it the other way. Don't say, I want to have a business with this many employees and then I'll worry about my life later. Because life's very short. I think we've all learned in the last few couple of years. Life's super short. And uh, at the end of the day, you're never going to be laying in whatever, laying wherever you're laying, thinking, wow, I wish I worked more, you know? Um, so I would say in terms of being a leather crafter that wants to do it full time, um, that would be my response, is to emphasize the times that you won't be working with leather while planning your leather business, because those are the most important times. Is that good? Is that okay? Miss Meme Girl? <laughs> I don't know what kind of life you're living, but... <laughs> meme Queen? <laughs> Oddly enough, Leathercraft does lend itself to like being able to look at a lot of memes while you're just memes, sewing for yeah, hours at a time. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, we also had one more question. Um, I thought that this was common knowledge by now, but someone asked me when we're getting a sewing machine. I don't... We hand sew. <laughs> so, like, that's our thing. Like, yeah. we don't... We're not... I don't think I'll ever, I mean, the only, so I have been thinking about a sewing machine lately because I've been making more bags and it makes sense to machine stitch lined shoulder straps. Hmm. Like that seems like a lot of pointless hand sewing. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's not like a strength thing. It's just like a pretty thing. And it would, it, yeah. And it would lower the cost it, for, of lower everything. Lower the cost, take a lot less time. Yeah. And then you wouldn't be relying on it for the other things, so you wouldn't be getting frustrated and trying to fix it the whole time. That's my only thing with sewing machines. They just always, they're always getting jammed. They're always And like, I've never owned one. Well, I owned one once and I made a tote bag with it. Like, yeah. That's it. Never, I mean, not a leather sewing machine, obviously. Because they used but, to make bags and stuff. <laughs> um, but like, d making quilts and... Yeah. I just, I don't do it anymore because it's so frustrating. Yeah. So the answer to us is, uh, the answer from us is like why we don't use a sewing machine is just A, because we never have all of our dyes or hand sewing, but like we lost power for, God, Kaylina didn't have it for almost a week. And we were able to, you know, we didn't really have a good internet or anything. It was hard to film and that kind of thing. But we were like, we physically worked the whole time because our shop uses zero electricity for anything important besides like the sander, but we can sand by hand if we need to. Hmm. So um, maybe you'll see a sewing machine. Um, but it'll only be used for like strap work, but I have no plans to ever, you know, I've been through the whole, let's expand now, let's dial it back. Like we just talked about, we're at a very comfortable position for the amount that we sell. Um, our sort of, um, our business mantra is to be okay with enough. I think we see a lot of companies come in and be like, we sell other wallets and then they hire 15 or 20 people and then they have to sell so much to keep going. We're just a small, sustainable, two-person little leather shop, and we love it that way. Um, and, you know, extreme growth has never been on the radar for us. Um, we just want to be comfortable and be able to, you know, send Kaylina's kids to, can go to school, and I can buy groceries, and, you know, that kind of stuff. So probably not going to be seeing a lot of sewing machine content anytime soon. But that being said, this is only as far as I got. You guys had some good questions. I'm sorry I worked slow, and... I guess there are times when I'm not looking in the camera that it would be a little more engaging if I you had a face to put to this voice, but you're not going to get it anytime soon, so this is the best we can do. Um, I'm going to start finishing up these bags because these are my weekend project. 
and thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one.